Hi, my name is Melina Kibbe and my co-host is uh, William Pierce and I'd like to welcome you here today to the SVS interview series on interviewing pioneers in vascular surgery. And today it is our great honor to have Alexander Whitehill Clues as uh, the person that we will be talking to today. Dr. Clues, thank you for coming. You're most welcome. <laughs> um, let's start off by you telling us where were you born and raised? Being the uh, product of a old-time Bostonian family. I grew up, I actually was born in Boston, and then I grew up there for a few years while my father finished his residency. And then we moved to Toronto, where my father worked with Charles Best, known as the other partner of Banting in the discovery of insulin. And then we moved to Cleveland, and that's where I spent most of my formative years before finishing up college and surgery training. Tell me a little bit about your parents. First, give me your parents' names and tell me what did your parents do? My father is George Clues, actually George H.A. Clues Jr., his father being George H.A. Clues Sr. And he was uh, born in Buffalo, grew up in Indianapolis uh, at a time when my grandfather had moved to Indianapolis to set up the Lilly Research Labs and generally add scientific uh, research to the Lilly uh, Enterprise. And he had a brother named Alan Clues, uh, and the two of them were raised primarily in Indianapolis, although born in Buffalo. And my father had a career in surgery, much as I've had, uh, even though his father was a biochemist. And his career uh, was largely academic. Uh, his first job was in Cleveland, and then he subsequently went to Charleston as the chief of surgery, and then wound up at Harvard uh, for his last uh, years. And your mother? My mother uh, grew up in Boston. She grew up in a family that dates back hundreds of years, named Jackson. Her uh, maiden name was Margaret Jackson. And she was uh, always a sort of a mother and a housewife and a major figure in philanthropic organizations in the various towns she used to live in. Oh, so I can see the early influence mm -hmm. there. We'll get to that later. Now, um, do you have siblings? We were a family of five. I'm number two. Uh, we're now four. I've lost a brother. Uh, and uh, they all do interesting things. My elder sister lives up near Dartmouth in Lyme, New Hampshire, writer. And her name? Marty, uh, Margaret as well. Uh, the next brother, Tom, who's now deceased, uh, was an internist in Rochester, New York. Uh, next brother, Jonathan, is a well-known sculptor who lives on the coast of Maine, he used to live in central New Hampshire. And my younger sister, Edith, is a uh, professor of Slavic languages, uh, recently moved from this, in fact, this summer from Kansas to Charlottesville to take up a professorship there. Oh, wow. Your parent, parents must have been incredibly proud. Now tell us, why did you decide to pursue a career in surgery? Well, that's something I came to late. Um, I was always going to be a scientist. In fact, I was going to go into physics, but then as I went through college, I sort of hit the wall and realized I wasn't going to be able to compete in that game. So I looked at PhD programs in biophysics and found that they were a little bit limited and ultimately decided to go to medical school because I wanted to be sure that I could uh, work with human beings. And only tumbled into surgery at the very last minute in the end of the th third year of medical school. I was working at the Beth Israel Hospital with Bill Silen, uh, a gentleman who was, uh, had a very compelling uh, uh, program of, of research and surgery, uh, a very interesting man, somebody I'd never worked for, but I found that his idea of academic life and surgery was very interesting. And at the very last minute, changed my mind. Went into surgery. <laughs> well, what was it about his life that you thought was interesting, though? Well, he had a, a multitude of uh, uh, surgical interests, but one of them was uh, uh, endocrine surgery. And I found it very compelling that he'd show up with a file of papers on calcium metabolism, expect me to read it by tomorrow then discuss it with me thoroughly, and then go and take out the parathyroid adenoma. I thought that was pretty cool. Interesting. And so your father being a surgeon, did that play a role in influencing you to go into surgery? Uh, no, actually. I, I was much more influenced by my grandfather, who was a biochemist, 
and by my father's work in research. And then ultimately we did share surgery, but we shared even more of the research. Interesting. Now, after you decided to pursue a career in surgery, um, you trained with Dr. Manick and for your vascular surgery fellowship. Correct. Right. I, I did my general surgery training in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and I oscillated between Cleveland and Boston. Did two years in Cleveland, and then I went and worked at uh, Harvard Medical School with Morris Karnowski to learn, you know, vascular biology. Went back and finished up in Cleveland, and joined Manick for a year at the Brigham. Okay, so then I should ask you, what was it that interested you in vascular surgery? That's a very good question, and it comes from the research again. I uh, had intended when I went east to go and do the postdoctoral fellowship with, John, uh, with Maris Karnowski to work on vascular, uh, on immunology, perhaps tumor immunology. I was very much interested in the work of Judah Folkman. Turned out that what was available in the lab at that time was a project in vascular injury and repair. I got into it, got very interested in it, and it stuck. Yeah. And then I came back to Cleveland and started doing vascular anastomosis, which I thought was great fun. And then I ran into a problem, which we all run into, which is that about a third of our patients get into trouble with stenosis or restenosis. Yeah. It's a problem that afflicts all forms of vascular reconstruction, and then things clicked, because that really annoyed me that Mother Nature was screwing up my reconstruction. So. I figured I'll do something about that. And uh, having had a background in vascular biology, I thought, well, we'll combine the vascular biology with a vascular surgery career, and that's worked out very well. So when you did your vascular fellowship with uh, Dr. Manick, what was it like to work with Dr. Manick, and has he influenced you in any way? Well, he's an enormously bright man, a very capable leader, and, and parenthetically not known to a lot of people because they have not worked with him. He's a very great clinician and I worked really one-on-one. -on -one. It was an old-time apprenticeship, which I would see every single one of his patients with him, and we'd discuss the patients, and then we'd take care of them in the operating room. And it was a very pleasant and useful, uh, informative experience, and he certainly modeled what a academic vascular surgery career uh, might work out to be for me. We had some disagreements. Um, he thought I ought to go and do a career much like Stanley Crawford's career, big practice in thoracic abdominal surgery. I said, but that's not what I want to do, Dr. Manick. And, uh, but it has worked out very well, and we've been close friends ever since. Uh, and I've worked on many projects, including the one on the career development program. I want to back up a little bit, and I want you to tell me a little bit about your childhood de development and life and how that shaped who you are today. Well, there are a number of influential people in my life. Uh, that's always the case. And in living in Cleveland, we're not so far away from Indianapolis, so I saw something of my grandparents all the time, and I always had a huge respect for my grandfather and admired him and admired the stories that surrounded him. After all, he was the one who set up the Eli Lilly Research Labs. His first project was the purification of insulin, and everything else is history. It was an enormously important contribution to the world. And then my father also was uh, very interesting in the sense that he was dynamic. He really turned me into a good sailor. Uh, he was an extremely good father, and he shared research interests with his father and then with me. So I grew up in Shaker Boulevard, uh, building oxygenators in the basement. My father's first membrane oxygenators really did work, and he'd sort of plug the leaks with some chewing gum and try them out on a dog. If they worked, he'd go and try them out on a patient. So your home was a laboratory? Your home was a laboratory, and that was very exciting. Now, being a Bostonian, what in the world attracted you to go to the University of Washington, half the whole continent away? Well, again, interesting. It was uh, sort of the 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 uh, the pioneer idea. I couldn't find a job in New England that, that would suit me, that would allow me to do research and surgery. They wouldn't even offer me a quarter broom closet. And uh, one day, I ran into a colleague of mine in, in, from Seattle, Steve Schwartz very well-known vascular biologist uh, on the back of the Brigham on Francis Street. And Steve is a rather rotund gentleman. And he was rolling down the street and he sort of collared me and said, well, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm trying to find a job. Can't find a job. He said, oh, well, I know John Schilling. And sure enough, he talked to Schilling. And two weeks later, Schilling said, wouldn't you like to come out and have a look at the University of Washington? 
And I knew the University of Washington. I didn't know about uh, Gene Stranus, but I really knew about their vascular biology, excellence in vascular biology. I thought, this is very cool. And, uh, well, went and looked and got signed up, and the rest is history. There was Steve Schwartz, and there was Russell Ross, and there was a large number of individuals. How did you all interact? Uh, very well. Uh, it, what was nice about the University of Washington and remains so is that there are no trade barriers. People are eager to help. They didn't have a clue what a vascular surgeon might do. But they said, give you a hand. Let's help you write grants, uh, get you started, and see what you do. And we're intrigued that I might bring in the human element to the, uh, that is to say, not myself, but the patients, uh, to, uh, to really extend their investigation towards human pathology. You had an amazing career at the University of Washington. And how, how did it all transpire with you and uh, Gene Strandis? He was another pioneer that, unfortunately, we don't have a chance to interview. Well, that's right. And Gene's uh, niche was in vascular imaging and diagnosis, and mine was in vascular biology. So we complemented each other. He always thought I was a bit limited. I thought he was too. Uh, but I pursued my interest and uh, didn't let him get in my way. And we had a considerable respect for each other, so that was fine. It was a truly a powerhouse place. Mm -hmm. Well, so you took the job uh, at Washington in 1980. And I have to say, as a fellow uh, researcher, I came to know you through your publications before I actually met you. Boring, and actually, huh? <laughs> quite no, and I quite revered you. Um, you have a um, very well known series of papers where you basically established an animal model of neontomal hyperplasia. And in particular, I still reference in all my papers your 1983 lab investigation series. Uh, that you wrote on defining the role of smooth muscle cell proliferation in new into hyperplasia. And you have several series. You also have a series that you went on to write about uh, vein graft into my hyperplasia. How did all these come about? I mean, this really, you, you kind of set the well, stage for this. Well, this is a very important question. And the, the, uh, in the inimitable words of Lord Kelvin, uh, when you know something, but you only know it in a qualitative way and you can't quantitate it, your knowledge is of a thin and meager kind. And I said to Steve Schwartz, the problem we face in vascular biology and in particular animal models is something quantitative that we can tweak and modify and pharmacologically manage and uh, come up with numbers uh, comparing A to B. And at the point that I arrived in Seattle, we had no such quantitative system. Steve Schwartz thought I was nuts. Hey, why are you doing this? You're not going to get funded. Well, I did get funded immediately. And we set up a system of, uh, in a very simple model, a straight tube, the rat's common carotid. Used a simple technique. Everyone knows Tom Fogarty's best two French catheter passed a couple times down, strips off the endothelium, injures the wall, and produces a very reproducible intimal thickening that you can put numbers on. And that was proved to be terribly useful. And I think literally thousands of people have used this system yes. for studying arterial injury and studying the effects of pharmacology, modifying it, and so on. So that was what got it started, and then it was a natural uh, drift to go into studying vascular grafts. And in fact, I can tell you that uh, the grant I have, which is entitled Mechanisms of Graft Healing, in its 27th year just got renewed for another four. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Did you, in those very early days, when you um, basically published on the rat carotid artery injury model, did you actually have grant funding to fund that work, or was this work you were doing just... Now, I got funded, uh, I arrived in September 1980, just after Mount St. Helens blew up, and I set about writing grant applications and got it funded on the first go in 1981. Oh, wow. I was lucky. Wow, no, that was not luck. <laughs> what, You're good. What's really noticeable about your career, other than your academics and research, is your mentorship. Where did that come from? You know, I think that's an extension of my own personality, plus uh, watching my father. My father took an interest in young people from all over the world, and he always had uh, young surgeons in his lab. You've just interviewed Tom O'Donnell. He worked with my dad. Um, and so I was always inclined that way, more on the research side than anything else. But today I teach students, I teach residents surgery, teach them how to do research. Um, and so 
things happened. Uh, for myself, I got one of the early career development awards from the uh, NIH. It wasn't called a K08, it was called, I think, an R16 or something like that, or R19, uh, which lasted for a few years. It wasn't a very large sum of money, but it did help a great deal. And from my own experience with that grant, plus my own inclination, it led to the interest in developing the, the career development programs for the SVS and for the college. Well, tell us a little bit more about that. How did that all transpire? Because that's become invaluable to Vasco State. So, apart from my own experience in getting a career development award, uh, when my father died in September 1988, uh, I wrote to Paul Ebert, then head of the Amer American College of Surgeons, and asked to come and talk to him about the possibility of setting up a career development program in honor of my father. At that time, the college had a series of one and two year grants, but not much more, and certainly nothing of five years duration. So I remember well, and it was either 1989 or 1990, and we'll have to dig up that information, sitting in a dusty room in, on packing boxes in the middle of an American college meeting with Paul Ebert, the two of us sort of dusting off the bench and sitting down and chatting about career development. And he was enormously enthusiastic, very supportive, and then there followed a, a further discussion, and ultimately we set up a five-year program to be administered by the college and named after my father, George H. A. Clues Jr. Memorial Career Development Award. And that has lasted to this day. It's now been subsumed into their K-8 program. But that was the real start of it from my point of view. And then that then led naturally into the programs that we set up at the SVS with uh, Jimmy Yao and John Manick. Um, and we can talk more about that if you like. I have to stop you there. The Clues Award for the college was the Clues Award. And when that was started, it was not part of a matching program, correct? Correct. So it had nothing to do with the SVS, it had only to do with the ACS. And it was a five year program of $40,000, $50,000 a year. Correct. So the for five first. Years matching program that you work to develop is the one with the SVS. Correct. Just want to make sure that's clear to our audience no, here. No, it's very clear. <laughs> no, the, the matching program started with the SVS and I think that the, the idea really came from John and Jimmy that, that we should really try to do something and then I think through our discussions we suggested the possibility of aligning with the NHLBI uh, we all knew that they had a K08 program, a five-year program, nothing to do with the SVS, and wouldn't it be interesting to develop a program in which there was partial funding from the SVS and partial funding from the federal government. And the, the purpose was not only to provide funds and support for a significant block of time for a junior faculty member, vulnerable state, uh, but it was also to bring the SVS into uh, uh, put the SVS on the radar screen at the NIH and make it visible as something more than just uh, clinical surgery. And I think we succeeded in that because uh, we had to go through a period of interaction with Claude L'Enfant, who was the head of NHLBI, which I'll tell you about. Um, actually, I know exactly the date. It was February 24th, uh, 1997, that the team of three of us went to visit him Jimmy had already had preliminary interactions which were not exactly satisfactory. And we sat down in Claude Lafon's office, and be, as his name suggests, he was French of origin. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there with him and his sleeves rolled up, and in the bookcase was Michael DeBakey. <laughs> I could see that he revered Michael DeBakey. Um, and we chit chatted for a while, and then uh, pretty soon he stood up and he looked at all of us in turn he said, well gentlemen, I think this, uh, this discussion is, should be brought to an end because he said, I don't think that the NHLBI funds any vascular surgeons. And at that point there was a little bit of silence and I said, well, excuse me, Dr. Lafa, I think that might be an error. I personally have four grants. I have two R01s, I'm a member of a program project and I work with Brad Burke to run a career development, I mean a uh, K, uh, what is it, the uh, institutional T32 grant. institutional training grant, uh, not for faculty but for, for residents. And he looked at me, he looked at Jimmy, he looked at John and he said, oh. And then we continued the discussion a bit more 
but I think he, we'd gotten his attention. And thereafter followed a series of discussions with his colleague David Robinson, who no longer lives, but uh, an Englishman who was very, very helpful in kind of getting things rolling. It took quite a long time because there were various elements that had to be dealt with. For example, we had to get them to agree to have true peer review. That meant getting vascular surgeons on the K08 committee so there was really proper review by people who practice surgery but also know vascular biology. And that took some time. And the NIH wasn't going, about to be lectured to, and so we had to sort of proffer a list and then they would select. And then we'd have to make sure, it, then they were objected to the idea of truly matching. They weren't going to have their grant uh, applications and awards contingent on things that the SVS was doing. And that got sorted out. But the final result was that, that if you got a K08 award and it was also f favorably reviewed, your grant application by the team at the SVS, then, then you got both. And so there was a matching grant for about roughly $150,000 and for five years. And that had all the right elements. It, uh, it was supportive for a prolonged period of time, one that was meaningful for a junior faculty member. You've had one, you know. Yes. Um, it put us on the radar screen. And things went along very well uh, after that. I, I think we were very, very successful. And in fact, the measure of our success uh, was uh, Rob Thompson's paper in which he summarized the first decade of experience in which uh, roughly half of our applicants got k weights. Not all of them got the money from the SVS. And nearly all of them had rolled over their uh, original grants into R01s. A truly successful venture. Now the bit that uh, I haven't spoken about is the support from the Liebigs. Uh, in those days it had become von Liebig. Uh, the von got added and I'm not sure I have the history of that. Yeah, what? But anyway, uh, John Manick and Jimmy Yao went down to talk to Bill von Liebig and his wife. And uh, I think at that time you met uh, Linda Hamilton and therein followed a series of discussions and they were willing to provide the pilot money to get the whole thing rolling. And Indeed, even to this day, we're extraordinarily grateful for having them launch this neat, neat program. What do the Von Liebigs do for a living? Where is, is, where is this Well, Bill Liebig, in his previous iteration, uh, was an uh, entrepreneur, and he ran the Medox Corporation, made Dacron graphs. And I'm sure Bill's used plenty of them. <laughs> you know, that was unique for the NIH to start a combined grant with a society or any other organization yeah. that you didn't. So it was yeah. truly unique. And you were able to you know, garner the money from the Von Liebig Foundation. And then the issues came later when we needed additional money to support it. And you also helped at that time in a crucial juncture with the ACS. How did that all come about? Well, and I should probably be careful about what I say here. I, I was getting a little uh, uh, disillusioned with our own specialty at that time because the language we used in those days was the language of samurais. We spoke about blood on the floor and victors and vanquished. And that's not what I think of myself. I don't think of myself as a samurai. So I, I turned to the American College to talk about the, uh, the career development program that we'd set up with the SVS. And I explored the idea with Alden Harkin uh, about, and Brent Eastman and others about the possibility of extending it. Uh, because the college at that point was doing a superb job in supporting education and practice. But it wasn't doing very much in the area of research, and it wasn't very visible with the NIH. So it had the same problems the SFS had previously. It wasn't very visible. And furthermore, it wasn't underwriting the research enterprises of the uh, specialty societies. So we cobbled together some new ideas, uh, mostly in discussion with Alden Harkin. Um, in which we proposed that instead of one-to-one -one match, we would have the college combined with the specialty society match the NIH. So the college would pay a quarter, the specialty society would pay a quarter, the NIH would pay half. But this required 
some creative thinking. Uh, for example, it wasn't going to all be vascular biology, so we had to find comparable NIH partners. And our first partner was with the, you'll have to help me out, NIGMS, mm -hmm. or, uh, mm -hmm. is that right? National Institute mm -hmm. of General. This for your, the trauma, the ACS trauma award, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to extend the GHAC award and make it not only five years, but make it much larger. And that worked. And that's what goes on today. The, the, the original George Clue's Career Development Award has now been subsumed into a uh, grant that is uh, used by the uh, trauma societies in conjunction with the college. And I believe there's the trauma society, there's another one with the triologic society. Well, that's, that's the, I think, the ENT surgeons. Yeah, there's several matching. And, the, and, and now I think we have five or six of them. I think urology's got one. I think neurosurgery's got one, and we've changed ours so that we're doing that. This is something you did, right? Uh, that you made that switch to, so that the SVS pays part and it's matched by the college. Every time we've come up with problems, you've found a solution, so there's been lots of challenging times in your life, and how have you addressed those? I mean, what was your personal characteristic that brought you through these difficult, challenging problems? Well. I think it comes right down to the individuals who are going to receive the awards. I mean, if you think through your career in academics, you, Melina, think about your career in academics, you exited your residency and your research training period full of enthusiasm and immediately got hit by this tsunami. People pulling you one way, pulling you another way, please cover my practice, please do this. And the only solution for that vulnerable period is cash. And he who brings in the cash pays the piper and calls the tune. You know, he, that, that's, that's, what, that's the way it works. And furthermore, uh, you not only need cash, but you need unlabeled time, and you need a prolonged period of time to work in order to get launched. It doesn't happen overnight. And those are very simple ideas, but very compelling. And that coupled with the fact that we had a, just a large crop of really bright people coming behind us, Bill, that needed help. I mean, that's the thing that drove me all along, is what can we do to make sure they're not lost? We don't need more lost generations. So to follow up on that, as you now take a step back and reflect on your career, which is still amazing and in progress, what do you consider the greatest challenge that you, Alec Clues, has had to overcome? Perhaps the greatest challenge might be that, that to continue to convince people that it's okay for vascular surgeons to do serious basic research. Uh, I had various people uh, tell me that I was on the wrong track. At times Gene Strandness, at times John Porter down in Oregon. I mean, on the one hand they say, well, we like what you're doing, but we don't think it's, it can be extended to anyone else. You're crazy enough to make it stick. Uh, I, I disagree with that comment. I, I think that uh, lots of people can do it. You two have done it. Uh, and uh, I, so th that story had to be told over and over again, and the case made in a more compelling way. And finally, the resources brought to bear that it really could make it happen for other people. I really did not want it to be a unique feature of my life, even though I had plenty of times when I wondered whether I was going to continue to succeed. Well, I know my generation appreciates all the work that you've put in for this because you definitely have paved the way. And, and your contributions to developing you know, the SVS or the Von Liebig Career Development Award are just instrumental to vascular surgeon scientists. Because you mentioned I have had one of those awards, and that award was instrumental to my career development. So yeah, I thank it, you. It allowed you to have a peaceful time at least it did. part of every month. To, to, to pursue your work it and pursue your ideas. helped to allow my mentor to protect my time. <laughs> yes, that's right. It, that's right. That is a very important idea because if you give your boss the resources, the cash, he I was mean, it's able hard to, to it. say no. <laughs> it, it, it always is. <laughs> Melina. Now, uh, back to you. What, <laughs> what, and also looking at your career, what do you consider a highlight of your career to date? I think I'm actually in the middle of it right now. Uh, I've been obsessing all my life uh, with this problem that got me started, which is one in three of my patients going to get into trouble. 
and Mother Nature reliably screws up your reconstructions, whether it's a bypass or an endarterectomy or a stent or an angioplasty. It, it amounts to the same thing. It's about one in three. And I've understood nothing about the variability. And we thought all along that it might have to do with cardiovascular risk factors, too much cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, or maybe too much injury. So I know Bill is the gentlest possible vascular surgeon in the world, but even when he is at his gentlest, he still creates injury when you sew things in and cut into vessels. And what accounts for this, the variability in the scar tissue? And just in this last 18 months, we've come upon a genetic variation that may account for a large part of the variability in outcome. And if we're right, and if it extends to other forms of reconstruction other than vein grafts, we clearly know that it has to do with vein grafts in the leg and stents in the coronaries. Mm -hmm. We're right now checking out whether it has anything to do with AV grafts and AV fistulas. We don't know where it will lead, nor do we know if it's the only story. It's probably not the only story. But this coupled with what happened last week, now we know that the junk DNA is no longer junk, but it controls in big time the uh, collections of genes. We live in the age of genetics. Yeah. We ought to get involved in that. I'm struggling to get involved. I have on my desk at work Tom Strachan's textbook in medical genetics. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> so, so this is really fun. I, I've enjoyed all the other bits, but the extension of the work into the human domain, into dealing with no longer with animals, but actually with patients, has really got me very excited. <laughs> wow. Well, having seen some of the data, I agree with you. With such a curious and thoughtful mind, what do you do in your spare time outside of your academics? Uh, my wife Susan and I have a great time living in Seattle, and uh, even though we're not musicians, we're enthusiasts, so she looks after the opera and the chamber music society, and I look after the symphony. What's uh, your connection with that? Well, I've worked for about 20 years with the symphony, helped build their symphony hall, one of the great halls of the world, Benaroya Hall. It really has got acoustics better than, I think, any hall in the country. And we've, uh, I've been involved with all aspects of it. I run their planned giving program. And I got involved with the recruitment of their new music director, Ludovic Morlo from Lyon, a fabulous man. He's gonna transform our symphony. I'm having so much fun with it. And it's sort of, sort of a, a leitmotif balances out the, the serious stuff I do in the professional world. Huh. That's fabulous. You've also received many awards uh, so far. There are a couple I wanted to ask you about. In 1987, you received an award called the Loyal Davis Traveling Surgical Scholarship. That has meaning to us both at Northwestern. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that award. It was an award set up by Loyal Davis's family at the college. It was a traveling fellowship. And at the end of my period of my RCDA. I had one year that I wanted to use to go and teach myself molecular biology. I arranged with my buddies in Geneva, Switzerland to do this, but I needed to find some cash. So I used the last year of my, my career development award, and I also supplemented it with uh, the Loyal Davis Award, which I was lucky enough to apply for and get. I don't think the awards exist now. I don't think so either. I think it's been terminated. No. Yeah. Well, I was interested to see it on your CV. But it's another one of those Career, career development, career supplementing things that really make a difference. Yeah. For me, it transformed me from being just a pure morphologist, a microscopist, to a molecular biologist. What did it mean to you to receive the Flance Carl Award from the American Surgical Association? Oh, that was a magical moment. It occurred down at the Breakers. It was the year that Carlos Pellegrini became president, was elected president, and 30 minutes before he was elected president, I was given that award. And for me, that was very meaningful because it meant that my peers in general surgery and in all surgery, because the, uh, uh, that society is made up of surgeons from all specialties, that they valued what I'd done in vascular biology, and that meant a lot to me. Tell us a little bit about the Clues Fund. Well, now you're dealing into, uh, with ancient family things. My grandfather, apart from being a brilliant biochemist and the manager of the, the research operations at Lilly also had side interests. He kept the Indianapolis Symphony 
running. And he was also a collector of art. And he lived in an age where there was fantastic art to be had during the recession or, or depression of the 1930s. And he collected a great many old masters. And as he grew older in the 1950s, he realized that he wasn't going to belong for this world. And then he had to do something with his collection. So pushed by the IRS, <laughs> he, he, set it, he set up his collection together with funds to support it as a foundation, the Clues Fund. And uh, he set it up in his house. So it became a mini museum in Indianapolis. Oh my gosh. And subsequently, we've transferred the art to the Indianapolis Museum of Art on long-term loan with the expectation uh, eventually to give them permanent ownership of it. And the funds that were set up to support uh, the art are now used for other things, philanthropic purposes. We make uh, grants in New England and the central Indiana and the Northwest uh, in the area of uh, arts and education and uh, several other areas. And what's your role right now with the Clues Fund? Well, I'm the president. <laughs> so as with many other things in my life, I have side agendas, and one of them is to convince Generation 4 that philanthropy is an interesting thing to do. Do any other family members uh, participate in the Clues Fund with you? Yes, pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've been associated with the SVS for a very long time. Tell us about your view of the SVS, the relationships you've developed within the SVS, its meaning to vascular surgery. Well, the SVS is a very important organization to me. It is the central organization in the country and in the world uh, that represents vascular surgery. Uh, and when I started, it was, uh, shall I say, the academic S uh, uh, society, uh, and it was partnered with the ISCBS. ISCBS, and then they were merged a few years ago, and I think that's fine. And so we clearly have one organization that speaks for American vascular surgery, and I think that's fine. And it also uh, is a focal point for education, a focal point for shall I say, uh, vascular politics <laughs> nationally. And it also is a focal point for uh, vascular surgical research, something very important to me, as well as vascular practice, of course. You've been the head of the Research Council for a number of years. Is that correct? I have been, no longer. But I was involved with setting up the research initiatives with Strandis years ago, uh, that uh, forum, and ran that. and. So on, I, and yeah, I complemented that with the work side by side. At the same time I was doing that, I was also working at the NIH, so I asked to, acted as a liaison between the SVS and the NIH for a number of years. Do you feel that the SVS um, has advanced our specialty, vascular surgery? Oh, no question. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's amazing what it's been able to accomplish because it stands sort of David and Goliath against the American Heart Association and it's found a way to, in some sense, partner with the AHA, but also to maintain its independence and not get subsumed into the AHA. And I think that's an amazing feat. And uh, so, yes. What's your advice now that we're coming to the conclusion of our interview to young aspiring either medical students, residents, and even young vascular surgeons? I'd say if you like pipes, and I try to tell all the residents and students that pipes are much more than the heart. It's just a pump. What goes in it gets pumped out. That's what old Professor Starling taught us. But it's the pipes going all the way back to William Harvey that really, really are the important part of the circuit that uh, uh, really do everything. And uh, as a vascular surgeon, you get to work with those pipes, fix them, understand the diseases, and the field is extraordinary. I'd go into it again today if I had to start over because you can not only be a surgeon with a huge toolbox, open, endo, diagnostic, all is in that toolbox. Uh, and it's incredible to be able to do all aspects of your specialty. And I think that's rather fun. And also, on the science side, there are hugely challenging uh, problems to solve. And again, the toolbox is large and full. So I'd encourage anyone who has an interest in plumbing, that is red plumbing, 
to, to really look at this specialty because I think it's really interesting. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us that we have not touched upon? Yeah, this is a fantastic project that you guys have undertaken to document the, 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 the changes in vascular surgery, the history, the trajectory, the future. I think it's fantastic. And we thank Dr. Yao for his efforts. It's a tremendous effort. <laughs> Jimmy has always been the guy who glued people together and made things happen. This is true. Well, thank you. And we thank you for flying in for the day to allow us to interview you. We really appreciate it. And I think the SVS membership will really appreciate listening to this interview. Thank you. <laughs>
the fact that I think he has turned this into what else can I do so long as I am able to do things to continue to help humankind. In 2005, Dr. Clues was recognized by the American Surgical Association with the Flance Carl Award. This is an award that is given to surgeons in the United States who have made seminal contributions in basic laboratory research, which has applications to clinical surgery. So really, this award served as recognition of Dr. Clue's body of work and his contribution to vascular surgery. Dr. Alex Clues is well known for his passion in vascular surgery and particularly his passion for the study of new animal hyperplasia and vascular disease. However, Dr. Clues has another passion and that's the support of uh, charitable organizations within the city of Seattle. Alec is the president of his family foundation, the Clues Family Fund. The mission of this foundation is to support the charitable activities of its members and family members in the cities in which they lived. In Seattle, Dr. Clue's passion was the Seattle Symphony. The Seattle Symphony is an American orchestra that is nationally and internationally recognized. It has more than 350,000 listeners and has won numerous awards including 12 Grammys, 4 Emmys, amongst other things. Dr. Clue's family has funded the Clue's Family Concert Masters, and in the past it was Emma McGrath and currently it's Cordelia Mercus. He's also provided funding for instrumental and music education and for critical thinking and creativity. And I think you can see Alex's com combination of science and his love and passion for the symphony. He has supported the Seattle Youth Symphony Orchestra which is a partnership between the symphony and the public schools in Seattle. This program is to address the inequities in musical education and to provide those less fortunate with the opportunities to pursue a career in music. Along with his generous support of the symphony, he has supported the Seattle Opera, the Arts and Lectures Program, the Seattle Art Museum, Art Corps, which is another program for children, and the Playwrights Festival and Chamber Music. In sum, Alex is a multi-dimensional man. His curiosity and intellect have driven him to pursue academic excellence in vascular surgery, while at the same time pursuing his passion for creativity and the value of arts and music in our society.